Welcome to the Wheeler Centre and to the Relative State Series. I'm Alicia Sometimes and today we're in for a treat. Two great minds, formidable intellectuals who would be a great addition to any dinner party and whose words you may have tucked up with at night. They've been married 33 years. I asked Anne, is there anything she didn't want to talk about? She said she wanted to start talking about her sex life, so no. <laughs> There was, and in brackets, not. But um, anyone who knows me knows that's just permission to go crazy, but I promise we won't. It'll be a whole different discussion. So 33-year married, which is amazing. Um, Anne Mann, of course, is an essayist, writer and social commentator who's been a regular columnist. Her essays on contemporary life regularly appear in the monthly. She's the author of Motherhood, How Should We Care for Our Children, which was a finalist in the Walkley Award for Best Nonfiction Book of 2006. The quarterly essay, Love and Money, The Family and the Free Market in 2008, and the memoir, So This Is Life, Scenes from a Country Childhood in 2009, and a bestseller, The Life of I, The New Culture of Narcissism, which was just shortlisted for the Queensland Premier's Literary Prize. Um, and Robert Mann, who is Emeritus Professor of Politics and Vice Chancellor Fellow at La Trobe University, a convener for Ideas and Society program. An historian, a public intellectual, he's the author and editor of around 20 books, including The Petrov Affair, In Denial, The Stolen Generations, Left, Right, Left and Making Trouble. His books and essays have won various awards. In 2012, he was shortlisted for the Melbourne Prize of Literature. His book on Julian Assange is part of the Short Black series. Um, and I am sure among many in his book, Making Trouble, he dedicates his book to his wife, Anne, and two children. And writing in the introduction, he says, and to the great love of my life, my wife, Anne, lifelong companion and soulmate. So, w big round of applause for these two wonderful people. <laughs> So let's start at the beginning. 33 years married. Did your eyes lock across the room? How did you meet? Well, um, we, we actually wouldn't have met if it wasn't for the fact that I'm a kind of late person. So um, I tend to arrive late. For the, I make a big effort, but I'm not good with time. Rob's a really good with time. I'm very good sense of direction. So, you know, we're, we're together we're great. And but I, I, I get lost in my own house. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> so I, I, um, I, I wanted to sign on for a German history tutorial um, uh, at Melbourne University, and I wanted to get into a different one, but I arrived too late. So um, I went into an evening class um, with Rob, so that was how we met. But nothing happened during that year. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> nothing untoward. But we did. Uh, we were. The attraction was immediate, um, and uh, it, it, yeah, it was a very. It was um, extremely intense kind of way that we were able to. We, we understood each other in a very deep way, very quickly. Um, it, it, even in those rather constrained circumstances, I think that would be fair to say. Um, and Robert, what did you think when you saw Anne? Well, I mean, uh, Anne's right that we, it was an attraction. Um, I, w I was a very proper young man, tutoring, I can imagine. Tu tutoring history. Um, and I, I was very struck with um, not only what she said in classes, but I remember an essay she wrote on the um, German takeover of Austria during the Nazi period. <laughs> I, um, maybe, I mean, I had, it's just now I've thought of it, I didn't, had never thought of it, but it was something that my father was, uh, his life was shaped by. But anyhow, I, I, I remember something about the essay which was more than historically interesting. It was very rightly and, and moved me uh, in its um, talking about what happened that time. So two public intellectuals who um, had this attraction and when it was a proper time to, <laughs> to court, w what did you do? How, did you ask her out? Anne, Anne has got the memory. <laughs> well, well, there was, there was a lot of muddle actually because... I mean, this is life. <laughs> yeah, this is life. But um, 
it, it, Rob was in, in a committed relationship, not a marriage, but so it, it, there was a lot of uh, muddle and no, things weren't quite clear despite this um, incredible closeness we had and, and, and great attraction. But anyway, that came to an end and um, at, at, at that stage I was teaching at La Trobe, um, which it wasn't quite kosher. Anyway, <laughs> see, we're already getting into dangerous territory. Um, it, it, it was a love affair. It was a real love affair, that's, that's true. And um, it, it was kind of still a love affair. And, and w there was... It, it wasn't, you know, I wasn't a public intellectual. Rob wasn't a public intellectual when we started. Mm. He, he was, he's older than me. He's eight years older. Um, and, you know, I made... Seven this and a half. <laughs> Please. I think it is eight, but anyway. Um, we, we weren't a public family, you know, we weren't... Mm. My, my um, writing life came later. I was almost 40, I think, before I started publishing because I'd made a decision about family life that there was going to be, you know, I, I was going to be the, the, as they call it, primary caregiver, but, you know, the... the and so... Um, Rob, by that stage, had started having a public identity, you know, and a well, life. barely. Um, I mean, I, I, I began as a sort of um, conventional academic, and I, I got a job at La Trobe University. Um, I think I might be the last person in the world who uh, was appointed to a tenurable lectureship without an interview, uh, <laughs> because That's saying uh, something. Um, the professor there, a man called Hugo Wilson, believed in. A, a, someone who had a great effect on my life, a slightly strange person, a, a Czech Jewish intellectual called Frank Nofelmacher, some people here may, may remember him. Um, anyhow, uh, yes, the, I can understand the hisses, he was a difficult man, um, but also a very brilliant man. Anyhow, he recommended me to Hugo Wolfson and I, I literally didn't have an interview, I was just appointed to a job for life. And I started as a very uh, conventional academic in the writing um, articles for English academic journals. But I, I just felt kind of what's the point um, to have 10 good readers and no one else. Mm -hmm. So I, it took a while actually, quite a while before I moved from being purely an academic to engaging in the public sphere. And it was I think a little bit after we were married, wasn't it? Oh yes, and it was often um because you were distressed or angry about something. Um, so there was a great controversy, for example, about, um, with La Trobe, about, because you spoke about some of the essays which you got, <laughs> and it went into the age, and it was a so great, great kerfuffle. Um, but it was often, you, you know, you were really engaged in issues to do with um, Pol Pot, Cambodia. Uh, you know, it was really... Passion. I mean, this is an interesting thing. I was actually on the left in politics um, as a student, quite sort of clearly. Not the hard left as in the Communist Party and so on, um, but I uh, was interested in environmentalism and um, feminism, sort of the new left, really. And people used to speak of it. They didn't realise any connection between us because we were not at that stage together. But um, people used to speak about Rob in the most... Um, a scathing and hostile mm. kind of way. They'd say, that Robert Mann fellow, you know, um, because he'd taken on issues like, but there was, a, it seems astonishing now, but there was um, great support amongst the left uh, for Pol Pot's regime, mm. and no one would believe that it was as bad as they said. So these were debates over pro-communist and anti-communist, and Rob was a, a really a, a kind of social democratic anti-communist. Yeah. So they were the first real kind of battles um, and, you know, during the time when, um, you know, we were growing up the children, as Indigenous people rather nicely put it, um, the, you were involved with many of these kinds of controversies. Yeah. Actually, we got a dog once because of a controversy. Can I just tell that story? Of course. Um, the, we are real cat people, so we always have endless cats. We adore them. But uh, little um, Kate, our little daughter, desperately wanted a, a, a dog. And um, I swore before having children I'd never do this, but I said, go and ask your father, OK? I bit a dog. <laughs> and so she went out and Rob was chopping wood and he was thinking about a particularly nasty controversy that was going on. And as the axe sort of struck into the 
uh, the, the pie and log of wood, um, Kate said, Dad, can we have a dog? And anyway, he said, yes, yes. <laughs> I don't think he really thought about it. So well, the first of our beloved border collies mm. sort of came out of this very nasty controversy. That but I should involved. explain that how I... I mean, there was a time... I mean, people who some will know anyhow. There was a time when I was editor of Quadrant. I think mm. Quadrant is a despicable magazine now. It wasn't always, and certainly wasn't when I was editor. But, um, um, I, I mean, I was within the context of Australia, a social democrat, I've always been in that mm. way on the left, but I was very anti-communist, and so probably the first real controversy I was involved with was concerning Pol Pot, mm. um, where I was, ver I was very much attacked for what I said, and no one would now, people would like to forget about all of that. But the reason was that, um, you know, my life, my family's life was completely affected by the Holocaust mm. and it's the centre of my political identity. And when I was at Melbourne University, um, I became convinced through reading and through two of my teachers that what happened in um, Mao's China or what had happened in the Soviet Union was part of a general movement which was called totalitarianism. And once I was convinced of that, then my political identity put me at odds with people I'd naturally be friendly with, which were people on the left. I believe in the egalitarianism of social democracy, mm. always have, always will. But I didn't believe that the egalitarian movement had anything to do with the criminal regimes that had been established since the time of Stalin and beyond. So anyhow, that meant that I was, you know, naturally my friends, um, many of them looked at me askance for the positions I took. There were some anti-communists amongst uh, the student group. I mean, my oldest friend is Raymond Gator, whose family came, you know, knew from their own experience about the communist movement, and so we've had parallel political developments. But anyhow, Anne was the, um, part of the anti-nuclear left, so it was a strange beginning in a way. So you, I can s sort of see where there may be heated dinner parties where you, you're full of discussion and that, that's the sort of romantic idea I have of you two, sitting over the dinner table just sleeves up, talking <laughs> politics all the time. Tell us about those early days. Uh, you know, obviously you fell in love with each other's minds, but what did you agree on and what perhaps did you disagree on? Well, I think this is quite interesting because I, I thought there was an issue with our differing perspectives, because Rob at that stage was a conservative. Um, he was um, really on the nose, you know, for many of the people I um, considered friends. Um, and it was re actually a, a, a Bolshevik friend of mine And when I discussed the, the kind of differing um, political outlooks that we had. He just said, how ridiculous, you can't possibly take that seriously. The only thing that matters is, is love. Um, and so it, 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 any kind of barrier I might have had in my mind dissolved at that point. I don't think we really thrashed things out, though, sorry to disappoint you, in, in that way in the early times. I mean, I, I partly think people have a right to believe what they do. I, I don't have a change agenda in a relationship, as it were, um, which doesn't mean I won't resist what someone says. And I, I think... So we... We kind of allowed each other's different positions um, to coexist. Um, but the deeper thing was on really central moral issues of life, we, we understood each other so mm. intuitively and instinctively. And I actually think one thing which shaped both of us was that um, we, we both had very close relationships with our mothers, both the youngest children, and both actually looked after our mothers during periods of great extremity, so that in Rob's case, um, his mother had multiple sclerosis and his father had died when he was 11. And uh, Rob had nursed her and looked after her. And in my case, my mother developed a mental illness when, um, again, she'd had it earlier and then it, it came again when I was at university. And so that this kind of way we understood each other that was to do with you know, when things fall down, mm. what's left, you know, is care. And to have that, kind, you know, I, I knew he was a good man <laughs> um, because of the way he, you know, when he, he talked about what had happened with his mother who then died when he um, was the end of his uh, year 12. Um, and then 
I, you know, I think that, you know, about all the sort of really deep and important things of life. And then, the, you know, I was never a pro-communist, so that wasn't kind of an issue. Um, I actually decided very early after reading accounts of people who actually committed suicide rather than go back to the Soviet Union after the World War II, I, I often decide things that are quite in, sort of in a flash. <laughs> but I just thought, you cannot be serious that this regime, which a lot of people still thought was, was um, on the left, was OK. It, you know, if, if people do that, then they're sa saying something absolutely real um, about it. And... So it, it, there wasn't that kind of conflict. It was more um, that, you know, there were a lot of people, you know, in Quadrant that worried me, you know, and... and <laughs> it was really <laughs> Anne's greatest um, uh, kind of tolerance was the hideous people that I was dealing with. <laughs> he's he's <laughs> put it less politely, <laughs> but... <laughs> um, that was would, an effort, moral effort. Some people that would bowl up in, and um, because I was, you know, you make kind of political alliances or, you know, and I mean, there are a few of the people that I published in Quadrant or a few of people that were, I was writing alongside who I now still am close to, but I would say 90% I can't tolerate. Um, but Anne put up with people. <laughs> um, that was probably the, the greatest gift she's ever done to not, to not walk out the door when some of these people turned up in our place or rang me on the phone. What was the point with Quadrant that you just thought, no, I'm out the door? Well, what happened was I, I, ne I in the 1980s, the things I wrote which people in Quadrant liked were connected with the communist movement and with Austra you know, Australia and communism. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm still battling on a question of Wilfred Burchett, which will never go away. But I wrote something on the Coombe affair and I wrote a book on the Petrov affair, which mm -hmm. actually even people on the left thought was a good book, I think. Um, it was an objective book. But anyhow, those were the things I wrote about and I, I was seen as the sort of bright young thing amongst that group. Um, but I was ne that period, the 80s, was the period when neoliberalism won the world. And I was never a neoliberal. I was always um, suspicious of it. And, and when I came, I mean, I've always, I've said this a number of times, I'll say it again, just by accident, the day I was appointed to be editor of Quadrant was the day the Berlin Wall was breached. And I thought, you know, the, the, the only reason that I'm amongst these people is anti-communism and it's now largely irrelevant. Not in China, it was the year of Tiananmen Square as well, but in, in other places mm. in Europe where my imagination was centred. Communism is irrelevant, so let's look at other things. So I began, it took a while, um, but I began to look particularly at the indigenous question, which I'd never really concentrated on before, to think seriously about it. And it, was, it became soon the time when the whole question of stolen generations came up. Mm -hmm. um, and I began to think about the Howard government. And I, I you know, I've, again, I've said this, and I, you know, I, I regret this, but I. It was true that I voted in '96 for the for Howard for complicated reasons. I hadn't seen, I'd been stupid, actually naive. I hadn't seen what was going to happen, as other people did. And I, I know I'd underappreciated Paul Keating, who I now admire a great deal. But anyhow, I I took Quadrant in a completely new direction, and um, I, I, met, I I had a debate about neoliberalism, which the old guard hated. And I then began to publish articles on Aboriginal questions, which they really hated. And then I had a strange falling out with Les Murray, the great poet, but he, he took offence at various things I did and then had an arg another argument about the Demodenko affair, which some people here will remember, where a, a, a really, I think, a very bad book was awarded the Miles Franklin, but it just happened that the chair of Quadrant at that time was Leonie Kramer, who was also the chair of the Miles Franklin <laughs> Award, which, and I wrote a book called The Culture of Forgetting. Which, yeah. So w there was one crisis after another, and eventually it was over Les Murray that I, I broke. Uh, that is, I decided to resign. But they wanted to me, re me to resign because I was actually taking Quadrant to the left, which they thought was well, wrong. Well, not many people can say a poet broke them, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, Anne, I'd love to go back uh, to you as a mother. When did you... Um, so you're a stay-at-home mum. When did you... Your writing 
life take off? When did you think, okay, uh, this is what I'm going to do? Um, well, look, I'd had a lot of encouragement when I was a student. Uh, people picked up the writerly thing, um, but and, and it, you know advised me to um, to take this further. But uh, I didn't have the confidence then. To, to do it, I thought they were mad or they were silly or they shouldn't be praising me in this way. Uh, but I did realise that I had a certain pa facility with writing, you know, with words. And, and I actually, did, although I'm very scholarly, I didn't actually want to... Uh, ha I was ambivalent about an academic career, which I was, you know, be in the early stages of. And so then um, I had these two uh, children. I, I thought about it and I, I had been in the, the, the feminist a group where you were expected to work and have childcare and a career and all the rest of it. Um, but partly the childcare, when I'm looking back, I don't know how I even <laughs> considered it really, it was really pretty awful that was available. And, um, I mean, we live out in the country mm. and so it's not a affluent middle class area at all. It's, it's, a, it's a very... Um, the, 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 the kind of childcare settings that I really examined were, were awful. So um, I made this decision and then... Uh, during when you say when I started writing, I was actually writing. I was thinking about all the things that went mm. into motherhood um, during this whole period, um, thinking that the way we think about all acts of care and motherhood are, are quite wrong um, in the way we dismiss it or denigrate it. But and not just mothering, but um, looking after people. I actually think though that the precursor to that was when I, um, at the end of my. Uh, fourth year decided not to go overseas because I felt my mother uh, needed me. I th thought that I could see how it was absolutely central to have someone in her corner from really... Actually, when I met Rob, that was when her um, things went pear-shaped for her. So I was a very central person for her and I had actually gone through a revolution in my thinking about ambition and so on. Not that I'd sort of given up wanting to strive for something or wanting to, to do something with, the, you know, in the, in the life of the mind, but that there are great, can be great claims on you that are entirely just. Mm. Um, and so I, I had really been through a, a, a revolution in thinking away from the individualist, you know, I must follow this path mm. and do what I... Because honestly, had I not s given my full kind of attention to her, uh, I fear what w would have happened. So... So when it came to the children, I was already sort of thinking about issues of care. Um, and, uh, I mean, we were united on it, wasn't... Sort of, mm. There was no conflict about it or issues. And then... But I, w I actually thought that the way feminism and motherhood and working and chucky was all framed was, on the one hand, by conservatives, um, sentimental and uh, kind of offensive because they didn't take account of... Um, the really serious things that were in feminism, but I also thought that within the discourse that was dominant at that time as, as a particular um, form of feminism was not taking account of what people's actual lives are like and the kind of moral dilemmas they suffer um, from on a, on a daily basis. So in reality, when I started writing, um, which would have been my late 30s, um, the book was kind of already in my head. And I've always had, because of the left, uh, my um, beginnings on the left, uh, that, uh, you know, I think that capitalism uh, shapes our, uh, not just our economy, but our social relationships. And so I was very interested in the potential to transform those really deep um, love relations into what I call commodity relationships. And I'd actually seen commodity relationships, I, I thought, very early on in the New Left and um, the kind of sexual life of, say, depicted in Helen Garner's Monkey Grip, where people are, you know, a commodity is replaceable, exchangeable, you know, and has a use value. So I, I felt you could see people being treated in, in this way. And so any form of commercialisation of intimacy, like, too, to take it to the next kind of problem for, um, you know, to, 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 to really be able to honour um, and take seriously people who are vulnerable, essentially, whether it's children or um, the, to, to simply place them, you know, in in different institutions, uh, I, you know, I found problematic. So in a way, the book was, you know, this is forming in my head. 
Um, but let, but <laughs> concretely, what happened was um, uh, Anne wrote this, I think, terrific essay on motherhood, and I published it in the Quadrant. And you know, and the, my enemies at Quadrant at that stage started saying, oh, you know, sniping, yeah. sniping, saying publishing his wife. Anyhow, it turned out that very quickly, I think there were four commercial publishers who were after Anne to to write a book for them on the question. It was a, a very a very unusual and fine essay. But that was the beginning, really, wasn't it? Yeah, the um, I immediately had an offer from I think it was Random House, and then I had an agent who approached me, and and I was actually very still very cautious because I I'm very ambivalent about becoming very public. I, I the private life is very important to me, um, and. So I, it took me a couple of years to accept it. Then I, I was offered a column in the Australian. I took it, you know. So, um, I, I, and I've become easier with accepting, and, and, I, and not only easier, I actually think it is very important for women, even if they feel resistant, to get up there and be public and have a go and not to be retiring. Mm. Um, and if you haven't read Motherhood, it's a fantastic book. And uh, <coughs> when I was with uh, my first child, it was it was it, because it's so inclusive and just some of the ideas made me feel, oh, there's other people out there like me. So that was a wonderful thing. And I want to talk about something from something so serious to something a little frivolous, music tastes. Because um, we kind of bond over politics or we, there's things we have in common. I'm just wondering, at home... What do you put on if you're relaxing on a Sunday? What, what's the music taste and who, who gets the uh, control of that? It's what more we watch. For music we listen to in the car because right. you're driving around yep. and so on and then we listen to, to whatever. But and the girls were very musical so we often had them. You know, one was piano and the other was oboe and something we really miss actually is hearing that ringing out in the house as well as them shrieking over... Um, <laughs> you know, funny TV and, and so on. But the, the thing we probably do most is watch films together. Would you, would you say that? Yeah, That's how yeah. we relax. Right. We, we, at a certain point we found, you know, like we work incredibly hard. Uh, both of us are, are slightly manic, I think, in the way we, you know, uh, get involved in a, um, a topic and we read such a lot and so on. But in the evening we like to come together and share something. Uh, and we love novels we both of us love mm. the fictional world um but we're kind of exhausted by all the reading we've done so we decided we, at a certain point we'd watch films and series you know very good series from hbo and whatever um and we have ditched i'm sorry to say the mainstream television but the, it's a sort of an imaginative world so that's actually the way we uh, relax to so switch off. I switch can't off. imagine you guys coming home and watching Master Chef. It just no, we used well, to do uh, well, that. We, it was see, fun. That was with interesting. The girls. That was there, fantastic. There've been two in terms of entertainment. I mean, with music, um, I sometimes listen to. Um, you listen to Bob Dylan. I, well, I listen, A lot. To Bob, I listen to Bob Dylan, but I listen to music mainly in the car because I, I have the radio when I'm reading. I, do, I don't have anything when I'm writing because I, I constantly. But um, I listen. To, I, 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 I'm a very systematic person, so I listen to all of the symphonies of Mahler in my car wow. <laughs> over a few weeks, and then I'm at the moment listening to Mozart symphonies. But at home, um, when we're uh, the days we're both almost invariably, if we're home, and we we are mainly we're reading and writing, so music is not part of that. And yeah. as Anne said, the evening is. Well, there, there were two phases. The first phase, when the children were there, we were, we did watch Master Chef or mm. whatever the girls mm. wanted to watch. They were, I mean, both, you know, very I mean, academic children, but also very into popular culture. It's sort uh, of exuberant. You know, uh, um, and I, 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 I'm very pleased actually. We had that phase. They joke about us. They joke about. It. They say, look, we're not watching a film about an Iranian goat. We are not watching this. We're watching MasterChef. <laughs> Our older daughter came back from the US and she said she loves, um, uh, she's a moral philosopher and, you know, has a very esoteric life, but she she loves low-rent TV, as she calls it. So she said, Dad, you're kidding. We are not watching this. You know, so she had on MasterChef. And by the end of it, you were right in it. You were very caring you about one, cared about one of these characters. And so, and it's a lot of fun. You know, there's a, there, we used to watch television together um, I mean, I greatly family, miss that. Fun. Yeah. Um, you know, that was the time when, you know, we did things outside, and I used to chop wood when I 
was able to, and um, you know, my elder daughter would come down with me with our dog, and you know, she'd whip around the place and be chatting. But in you know, the the time the family used to come together was in the evenings, and then, you know, I was you know at first I think forced, but then took pleasure in ordinary television. And, yeah. You know, so what, what's it called, Australian celebrity or whatever, you know, those sort of things <laughs> that the girls wanted to watch. But it was good for me to... But anyhow, since, you know, both daughters are now out in the world and um, since then, you know, we've really... I mean, there was a wonderful place in Melbourne called Video Dogs. Yeah, changed which some our of you, lives. Which, which <laughs> has now shut down, but um, which had a, a library of world's great films. And when we discovered that they would mail them out to, to the country, which oh. they did... We could, at a certain point, we were watching, you know, me in a way, sort of more films than Anne could take because she reacts so strongly to them. But we were watching two or three great films a week. Wow. And, uh, and so we were having mini some... film festivals like the Iranian No, no it was actually week. seven yeah, days yeah. a week that I couldn't cope with that. <laughs> yeah. wow. So, Rob will, it's interesting, when he's finished work, um, if I'm in a really intense period of writing, then I, I have to kind of ward off the world, you know, I have to not take in anything more. Um, but he'll sit down and he'll want to really concentrate on a three-hour film <laughs> for, um, you know, of, of considerable um, complexity. So the films have to be, now this is a little marital adjustment, have to be when um, I'm not actually writing, you know, the composing part of the writing. Editing's fine and when it's, it's finished. Um, and series are better because you're already in that imaginative world and I kind of go into it too um, intensely. But apart from that... Uh, kind of adjustment. Um, the the films have been and in, in, include like these Iranian films, for example, which are really astonishing. Now, um, Taiwanese film, Chinese films, you know, and then many of the European um, kind of uh, classic, often very funny things. We like really old movies, and sh you know, we, we often sort of weep with laughter, you know, tears trickling down. With <laughs> so it's not it's not all uh, serious at all. And there's uh, you know, and often Rob and I will. Um, get each other laughing about something. Um, it is serious, though, in the sense that, you know, you were talking before about every night have a dinner, you roll up. You know. well, the time we actually probably most talk about things... Is the morning. Is the morning. We have always had morning coffee together, even if the girls have to be up early or used to be have to, up early for school or whatever, we'd, we'd get up even earlier and we'd have coffee together and we'd discuss kind of everything, everything from intimate family matters, matters or the things we're writing or politics or... You know, so so that's our time really to. Uh, yeah, I to mean, talk almost every morning, unless something major happens. Major happens. We would spend, I'd say, the first hour or hour and a half talking every so day. So sweet. So many people avoid each other in the mornings, don't they? <laughs> it's like not. And so you have your coffee and you talk about the. Yeah, we have coffee in bed. I I make oh. it, and um, we just sit there. And um, I usually have. AM or you know ABC radio is to follow the news. Occasionally, I'll say stop talking. <laughs> I want to hear the new thing about the refugees or whatever. This is less than <laughs> ideal, but anyway. uh, <laughs> yeah. But but you know it's it's just the pattern we've mm. and uh, you know I I mean I, I, it's the time when there are things to mull over about either the world or about family matters mm. or um, uh, any so well, what we're writing. You know, and uh, it, it's very helpful to be able to talk to someone, um, you know, I find, you know, uh, uh, like Robert, sort of to put, you know, my embryonic ideas out there and, and to, um, you know, to have his response to it. Are you each other's biggest champions? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, Rob's, I have to say Rob's been enormously important to me because my original family, is, you know, it's, it's actually got some good qualities having just written a book about narcissism. <laughs> which is very anti-braggy and very anti, you know, um, puffing yourself up. But it lacked that sort of um, the, the, the embrace of encouragement. Mm -hmm. And so partly I respect him such a lot. But it, I, and I, I did say, when I first showed him uh, my first essay, you know, which was the one on, I said, you have to be honest about this. You cannot sort of be... And he is anyway, he can't lie about something like that if he didn't like it. Um, but I knew, I knew he, he said, look, you've got a, a, a voice with a capital V, you know, which is something that is, is, was kind of, um, he thought, natural to me. So that was enormously important. And so he's, you know, he, when we go to Writers' Festival, people find it often rather sweet if we haven't got competing um, events, he'll come along always and 
you know, so he has really supported me and encouraged me. And he, you know, the thing about um, he's recognised sort of who I am in a deep way and um, encouraged me to, to, to be that person. So he will even push me on a little bit to say, yes, you can do this and, um, you know, to, to see the next thing that I, um, I might do. And he's also, you know, I mean, I, I've so appreciated having his um, eye as a first reader, which is both, you know, really um, encouraging, but um, he would say... Uh, you know what he thinks is yeah, I mean, there was, problematic. I, I you know, did a lot of work on. I mean, I, I was an editor at Quadrant. That was the first yeah. time I edited. But I've done a lot of editing. I've, a lot, I've edited a lot of books. I edited Quadrant for a number of years. I've edited the best essays for the last couple of years. Um, <coughs> so I've taken to the. You know, I've, I've been a sort of unofficial editor for Anne. We we read every word of each other, mm. always. You know, and Anne's always the first reader and of my work and, and uh, me of hers. Um, but, you know, I, 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 there was one chapter which was incredibly scholarly in the narcissism book, but I thought it was too hard for a general reader. Mm. And so I, I had to say it was painful. And I say, you know, you, you know, I mean, she worked for about three months on it, but I had to say it's just too, it's too, it's out of sync with the rest yeah, of the book. It was on psychoanalysis and, and it was as yet too hard. You know, so there's a, a mm. big process of writing something um, which is quite scholarly to get things sort of right and to understand it, and it was quite very, at that stage very long. Um, but I'd cut and cut and distill. But then by the time it was um, the right length, and Rob just said, "No, it's it's too difficult. You can't use." So it meant you know a lot of extra work and so on. But so I wept briefly. But um, that. Uh, but then yeah, you dust yourself off and. But yeah. Anne often picks up in my. I'm more a sort of like Prussian in my writing. I. You know, I, I, it's uh, and has a sort of sprawling first draft, and I have almost my first draft as my final draft, um, and it's just it's a, it's almost a matter of uh, temp style or some mm. deep kind of mental style. But often Anne will pick up when the tone is wrong in something, um, and it's very important to me that sometimes a joke you make is off, and you know my enemies pick it up very quickly, and so. <laughs> It's very important to have someone who can, who you know, is a writer who can see when you've made a false move. Um, so you've had now that the, the kids are out, you've had your morning coffee and you're in an hour and a half discussion, and Rob's listened to the news. Um, how's your working day? How's your writing day? Map that out for us a little little bit. Well, we go to our studies. Um, uh, the cats follow me down because they've come <laughs> <laughs> and they get, I have a heat. They've been on the bed with us. Right. Wedding, they're actually interested in politics as yeah. well. So <laughs> they come down to the bedroom. They're smart. <laughs> I, I have to admit this. I have a heated pet pad on the desk. I, I should confess that. But the two cats get on the pet pad, which is sort of behind the monitor and between the monitor and the... After um, they've scrambled through all the books and papers. Which yeah. <laughs> I'm very untidy, so there's this great piles of things um, and then yeah we um, we, we work all uh, all day and then uh, often I'll now you know I'll go um, for a walk later or, or um, uh, Rob's had very bad arthritis and we're going to start to do that together we used to walk with the dogs together um, and um, or, you know or I'll do uh, exercise and then you know with dinner and, and so on but um, I, I mean, Rob is yes. Rob is very Prussian. As I I'd call myself the tumbleweed, you know. So I sort of gather um, as I go. But we are both very concentrated when we mm. work, and it's it is great to have someone like, for example, I was writing a Wednesday lecture, um, which you just went to last week, and it was on the psychology of evil, and I was talking about Anders Breivik and the massacre in Norway. Um, and Rob sort of knew without me ever have, having to say anything that he would take over this, this and this um, and thinking about what I'd need to be able to just clear the decks and concentrate. And, and of course, I did that for him for many years and, and can still do it now. The, the only thing I will say is I think it's really bad when we both have total deadlines together. Which we have this month. So. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> but it's, we not, try not to The next to three that. weeks is going to be rather difficult because um, Anne's got a major piece for the monthly and I've got a a lecture I've got to give in Sydney and we have deadlines almost on the same day. So. And, and when children were present as well and they, oh. in a way they had their own deadlines, you know, <laughs> in the sense of VCE or, you know, the, their um, 
it's, I, I found that just impossible, you know, and, and maybe mm. people are better at it than me, but I just, I found it, I hated it, you know, being, if there was, I remember one time we, we were both writing columns for a newspaper and there were all these other, you know, children deadlines and there was the book deadline and quarterly essay happening, I mean, it was too much. And we kind of, we were both bleary-eyed and we'd been up very early working and um, we crossed in the corridor and handed each other our pieces and <laughs> went back again and, you know, and then came out and conferred. And, but it was it was too much, you know, so... Mm. Um, and, and I actually like... I don't like a workaholic life, so I, I would prefer to be, even though I'm slightly living like that now, but I, I, I would much prefer to have a life that's varied and mm. balanced with um, other things. Well, it sometimes... More. It's hard that uh, you can't predict when a writing assignment comes sometimes. And mm, mm. I've certainly been there with a baby with an earache and typing an essay and, yeah, it's an incredible thing. So before we go to questions, which I'd love you to ask of Robert and Anne, it, this is a universal question and you don't have to answer it, but the secret to a great marriage. It's a good answer. It's a good answer. I don't really know because I, actually I, I have two things. The first thing I would say is love because that makes everything possible. The second thing is whatever works. Yeah. Whatever works for someone. I, I don't think there's any rule. No. Um, but um, I, the, the only thing I'll say is I think if, if people have ways of conflicting that are contemptuous, it's a problem. Mm. You know, if there's a they're putting down rather than um, respect. I could see that that's a problem. But Sarah, but am I, can I say that? Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know about that. Um, I mean, obviously, um, love, which is undefinable. But, you know, in a way, it's partly uh, as soon as I notice Anne's upset about something, I'm aware of it and worried about it. It's mm. sort of the, appos the opposite of indifference. But I think... Uh, the other things I think that matter are um, real interest in what someone else thinks, which doesn't change and probably deepens over time. I think it, a really important thing is very simple, which is pleasure in someone's company. Mm. I think you know. I, I think a sign of things going wrong would be irritation with someone. I think that often would. I mean, I'm just guessing, but would 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 undermine a marriage. Um, so I think probably very simple things like that, uh, uh, for us anyhow, mm. is interest in what we're thinking, awareness when something's gone wrong just by the s smallest sign um, and lack of irritation, the fact that you know, if something happens I want to talk about it. I'm writing this down, lack of <laughs> irritation. <laughs> this, is, I'm, this is like sort of at the end of a tutorial where yeah, that's right. I point out what the Here's students should know. Here's my notes on your relationship. Yeah, but you enjoy each other. You know, yeah, it's true. Yeah, and you clearly that that's really evident, and I'd say people uh, in the audience would understand. Do we have any questions of Robert and Anne? There must be some questions. It's hard to say to when it's about personal lives. I'm sure you you two are not uh, so familiar with uh, chatting about your personal life in public. No, we've never done this before. <laughs> so this is strange. an exciting time. Let's press them. Come on. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm just wondering, have you done much travelling together? And when you do, if the answer's yes, how do you manage it? <laughs> Good question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, um, we, well, we just actually got back from a big trip, first to New Zealand and uh, then America to see our daughter, who's now living in the US. So that was a very big tr trip. Um, I, I think apart from the fact that I tend to be a little bit disorganised and Rob tends to be a little bit over-organised or perhaps it's the other way around but anyway we're <laughs> apart, and we're both kind of hopeless together really we? we almost missed the first plane so um, we, true. we sat down happily to breakfast and then we have we underestimated the time in the security queue so then we were kind of practically running and the um, boarding pass person, you know, we're the last people on the plane, scolded us, you know. So, you know, we, we, we weren't, we're not really good at it. But but then actually... And the day before yesterday, we went to Sydney for oh, our daughter's... Right, yeah. in, in, uh, lives in Sydney now. And we wanted to be there for her birthday. 
And then I said, what time's our flight? Because Anne's very good at organising flights. She said 8.30 a.m. And um, just by accident, her printer um, stuck. So she had to send me the, thing, the boarding pass to print out. I looked at it and I said, it's 8.05. <laughs> By this stage, <laughs> it was a a, a, you know, about, we live quite away from the airport. No? We, we, this mad scramble. So mm. things go wrong uh, with our travelling. But only We actually get along very well. So we did, there were very few arguments um, during that period. It's, so it's... I, I actually, it's a good question, actually. It's a clever question I think because. Travelling is one of yeah, those. Yeah, it really times does stress you. Because um, routines and have broken down. But we read a lot. I mean, we read all the time. We were actually preparing for Melbourne Writers Festival. Oh. Ben, Bendigo Writers Festival. I was reading Festival, An- Anthony Beaver's histories <laughs> in America. <laughs> so, oh, you relax with 1,500 <laughs> pages of a novel. <laughs> that's, yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, what aspect of the writing process? What aspect of the writing process do you enjoy the most? Well, I um, suffer from self-doubt, so that's why I, I have a process of building it up from kind of nothing. So sort of, I'll just keep working on drafts. So that, and it seems rather agonising um, until I get, you know, I'm very close to the final draft, and then I find it quite exhilarating. So it's really that final honing, and it, you know, you're realising what you can. Um, need to cut and what you know the um, making it more precise and and then it's really quite thrilling <laughs> um, until you're worried about how people are going to receive it mm-hmm. just yeah I mean I, I go through um, everything I write uh, almost everything I write requires quite a lot of research uh, I mean the more invisible that is in the writing the better but in fact you know there's an essay at the back of the room on Julian Assange which has just been published as a short black and I worked in a frenzied way in the research um, to do it. It was done quickly, but and I discovered on the internet I couldn't believe it that sc- people, journalists, best journalists in America, hadn't bothered to look at what was available on him, which I could do it, you know, through a computer in a country. And I loved that research part. I always do. Um, then I feel absolutely. Uh, there's George Orwell once said that writing was like inflicting pain on yourself, a self-inflicted illness. And I feel, I'm, uh, more now even than when I was young, I feel quite tense before I begin and think I've got nothing to say and it's going to be hopeless. And then once I start, I realise, I hope, you know, next time this is true, I realise that I do have something to say and then I, have to, I can shape it as I go along and, and so on. And then the pleasure I get is when it's finished and I think I've done as well as I can for that particular project. Then after that, I, I, I sort of hardly think about it again. I don't read much of my own stuff for a second time. I, I try mm. and get on to, to something new. Um, so it's, it's like in the whole process, there's pleasure in the research and pleasure when it's finished. And you know, Anne reads it, and if she says it's good, um, then I'm happy. And then I have a wonderful editor at Black Ink um, called Chris Fike, who's, I think, a great editor, and I always send everything even some stuff not for him, I send to him and he looks at it. And he, if he says it's okay, he's, he's, he's actually, he won't say he likes something when he doesn't. So I, I'm Have nervous you... with him. And then, but then that's the moment of pleasure and then I forget about it and try and think about the next thing. I'm just wondering, have you ever written something where someone said, Robert, you're tripping. This yep. is uh, not, not on... Not, not yes, t- yeah. Really? I wrote one piece. I, st- I still re- resent this. Um, <laughs> it, it was a nothing. I was doing I was I, I was doing blogs for the month, which I occasionally do, and I'm going to keep on doing. I'm, I'm the only person who blogs at four thousand words, but I, yeah. I, I, I'm going to do that. I wrote a piece recently on the encyclical, and I'm going to do more. But uh, I wrote one piece, which was a sort of a speech that Julia Gillard was going to give to a Labor Party conference. I still think it was quite a good piece. Anyhow. <laughs> I don't think he even showed it. I think Anne was away at the time, so I, I sent it to Chris. And he, unusually long pause, you know, before he emailed back. And he said, no, nah, no good. Mm. So I just dropped it. I still think I should have published it. <laughs> <laughs> but you so, listened. <laughs> but it doesn't happen that often. <laughs> no, um, I, I can imagine. Another question? 
Thank you. Robert, I was very interested in your story about the way in which Frank Knopfelmacher recommended you to Hugo Wolfson, and you were appointed to a tenured position at La Trobe without an interview. But my question is, did you know Hugo? Had, had um, Hugo Wolfson spoken to you before, or did he appoint you sight unseen? Oh, no, it was not sight unseen. I, I went to lunch once or twice. And, I mean, he was a very strange man. I don't know whether anyone in the room remembers him. Um, he was, in some ways, a very intelligent, almost brilliant lecturer. Uh, wrote almost nothing in his life. Um, I think he was a painfully unhappy man in many ways. Anyhow, and he ran the department like a little um, sort of concentration camp. And, uh, and every, uh, when I arrived there, it was La Trobe, early days of politics, everyone had to troop out to lunch with him as a compulsory matter. Uh, it was all very weird. Um, but, so I'd met him at lunch in that way. But it was, I'd written a little bit, I had one quite, I think, quite good academic article, and he may have looked at it, although I doubt it. But I was very young, and, mm -hmm. you know, it was... Th there was another professor there, a, a very... He's still around, a lovely man, Ross Martin, but he didn't... I think he might have s seen me at lunch, but even he wasn't much mm -hmm. consulted. It was strange. Mm -hmm. but, but it was a very strange department, because Hugo Wilson was a very strange person. Um, it was also the older baby boomers... Um, of which you would be one, 1947. Um, it's almost painful to say the ease with which you got tenure because late, even the later boomers um, had, you know, I, met, I was at, um, teaching at Melbourne University and the uh, then uh, kind of assistant, personal assistant to AF Davies, Fu Davies as we used to call him, the professor there, um, she took all the young um, staff who just graduated and were now teaching and she said look at all these people she said pointing to um, middle-aged men with sort of those leather patches on tweed jackets and they're waving sort of sticky buns with, dripping with butter in the air gesticulating she said look at them they will be in their mid you know you'll be in your mid-40s and they will still be tenured and not yet retired she said if you can think of doing something else do it um, and she pointed to Michelle Grattan who had become left probably on similar advice and gone off and has become the very wonderful political commentator. Um, I listened very carefully because I could see what she was saying. She was talking about, you know, a demographic um, issue of the boomers, the older boomers taking up. But then it, of course, um, it's become even more severe, you know, by the time I was leaving um, academic life or ac academic apprenticeship, as I'll call it, um, the even younger people were you know, there was a contraction of the higher education, you know, so that they have real difficulties. So it's almost rather painful listening <laughs> to, because the, the, some of those people are, are, are fantastic and have PhDs and they won't get jobs. They'll be driving taxis or something. And one last question. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing your lives with us. Um, Robert, I'm aware of your Jewish heritage and, and I don't know whether you are or not, but whether you are both Jewish or one is and one in it isn't, how has that impacted on your relationship and your lives together? Um, well, I am and Anne's not. Um, uh, I am only in the sense that I, as a child, took in what had happened to the Jewish people. I'm completely, I don't even know when, you know, some of my non-Jewish friends have to tell me when the Jewish holidays are. Um, I mean, literally, you know, I, I've not been at all religious. I was when I was young, and um, I asked lots of questions of the rabbi, and I could never get a straight answer. I know mean, questions as simple as, "Do Jews believe heaven and hell?" and and I, I just didn't get answers to the questions that I. So, I just didn't. I ended up when I was thirteen or fourteen, deciding that I didn't believe in God, and so my Jewishness, which is quite deep, is a cultural matter entirely. And um, so religion has never been a sort of issue in between us. Anne's also pretty nominal Christian. Well, no, yeah. totally nominal Christian. Well, yeah, it, it, it just... Only this, though. Um, my mother was an atheist at a time when it was quite unusual to have an atheist. And there was... Even when I was at primary school in a country town, there, 
there were disapproving noises about her atheism. But um, so I wasn't raised um, as, a, as a Christian. I think I was christened as an Anglican via my father, who was now, by now, back in Adelaide. Um, but w the actual the stories of Christianity impressed me profoundly. So um, just sort of simple things as a child. Uh, so, that, so they did actually, there's a, a, um, a line from Simone Weil, the Christian philosopher, which is respect um, is due to the human, human being as such and is not a matter of degree. And so there is in, um, not in the patriarchal aspects of Christianity, but in the, um, th there's a radical egalitarianism which is possible to, to think about the human being, um, that they, um, you know, that, that hierarchy, and I took that to be the, the message from what they were teaching us in religious instruction to do with Jesus and his behaviour, um, the radical dismantling of hierarchy. Now, of course, we know that church has not been like that and so on. Um, but those, those, yeah, those stories were, it was particularly important to me about uh, thinking about my mother because I could see the way she was often looked down on. And so my kind of inner resistance to that, um, uh, you know, I often felt like making small and eloquent speeches to people who treated her patronisingly. Um, but was, was given strength, I think, by the, the sense of, of um, the invisibility of life, um, nonetheless having an importance, um, having a moral narrative to, to a life that was not um, rich or famous or, 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 or whatever, but was of, um, you know, kind of a, a deep worth and no matter what the trouble in the person that they are regarded as equal to the next person. Can I, can I, so, I mean, I, I um, went to a, a, a very, uh, because where we, I lived as a child, I went to a very orthodox Jewish Sunday school, strange, people find it strange to have Sunday schools in a people that has their Sabbath on the Saturday, but um, anyhow, we, we went to a Jewish, a very orthodox Jewish Sunday school. I was completely, all the children there knew things and I knew none of them because my family wasn't really religious except in a very nominal way. So it was the only sort of tests I've ever failed. I used to, uh, it was quite completely traumatic for me. Anyhow then, but then at, at, um, at the primary school, I went to state schools and primary school and high school, we used to go out when the Christ so I didn't get these wonderful messages about Christianity because we were allowed to leave. But I, we, there, at one stage, there was a Jewish teacher who came in to deal with a few Jewish children who left the classes. And uh, what amused me was that the punishment, if we behaved badly, was to get us to stand up with our arms. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a long while to work out what she was doing. <laughs> she had a really deeply wicked sense of humour or something. <laughs> But you did teach Jewish Sunday school. Ramona yeah, Koval I, I, always I taught tells me Ramona Koval. She still remembers me as a, uh, a rather stern teacher at and the age of... And you got her too. <laughs> no. yeah. um, from no. religion to sex. Now, no, we've, <laughs> we're out of time. Uh, so join me in a big thank you to Robert Mann and Anne Mann. <laughs>